Hierbij I open this academic ceremony in which Lisa Maria Hillen Roos will defend the academic thesis Comprehensive Analysis of Spitzoid Melanocytic Neoplasms. New insights on the mRNA expression profile and their immunogenic properties. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Thank you, dear Prorector. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear colleagues, dear friends, and dear family. Lieber Matthias, liebe Julia und liebe Laura, thank you for letting me take your time and for giving me the opportunity to present a short summary of my PhD thesis research work today. In the following 15 minutes, I will first tell you about the skin and its general structure. Secondly, I will tell you essential facts about Spitz tumors. Third, I will evolve on my molecular genetic studies, which date back to 2016. Fourth, I will tell you more about the neighborhood of Spitz tumor cells, which is full of inflammatory cells. And in the end, I will give you an outlook on our ongoing studies and our future research plans. Let's go. This is the skin. And here you can see a cross section of the skin with its layers. The top layer is called epidermis, followed by dermis. And at the bottom, you can see the fatty tissue, which is also called subcutis. A close look at the epidermis reveals two major cell types which are squamous cells and melanocytes. Squamous cells lie closely together, thereby creating our skin by year. Melanocytes produce pigment, which then deposits around the squamous cells to protect us against UV light. And this is also the reason why we get brown in the summer. However, sometimes melanocytes go crazy and aggregates of these cells pop up once in a while, which everyone knows as pigment cell lesion. As you can see here, they can look quite different. Smaller aggregates can evolve at the epidermal junction, but also larger ones. These can migrate into the dermis or well, you can find them only there. A small group of these pigment cell lesions are the Spitz tumors, and they have a special, peculiar, awkward morphology. And that is why they are very confusing to the diagnosing pathologist. Now, key facts about these lesions. Spitz tumors are rare lesions. They only occur in about 1% of all resected melanocytic neoplasms and majorly occur in children or young adults. Why this strange name, Spitz? This is Sophie Spitz, an American pathologist who was the first to describe a whole case series of these lesions in children in 1948. And she was also concerned about the morphology of these lesions. And that is why she named these lesions melanoma of childhood. However, this first description was not correct. To be clear, the majority of these lesions is benign. Only a few behave atypical and a few are malignant with death of the patient. Furthermore, these lesions can also develop later in life. And that is why these tumors were renamed to Spitz tumors in honor of her. This is how a Spitz tumor looks in a children. It's reddish and dome shaped. And this is how it looks under the microscope. A close look at the cells 
reveals their peculiar morphology, which is epithelioid and spindle shaped. The diagnostic spectrum of Spitz tumors ranges from benign Spitz neighbors to malignant Spitz tumor, which behaves similar like malignant melanoma. In between, there is the diagnostic gray zone, the atypical Spitz tumor, where it is not well possible to predict whether there will be benign or malignant behavior. The molecular genetics are complex and quite different from conventional melanocytic neoplasms. And it's only recently that we can actually better associate distinct morphological subtypes with their genotypes. And this might help to create a better basis for a classification in the future. To be clear, these lesions are a diagnostic dilemma and make the diagnosing pathologist the treating dermatologist, but last and least the affected patient, seriously nervous. Furthermore, these lesions do something very weird. Even benign lesions can metastasize to the lo local regional lymph nodes, but then they don't go further. This turns our understanding of cancer upside down because actually it has always been thought that metastasis is a hallmark of cancer. Now, more about my molecular genetic studies from 2016. This is the starry sky of the National Park in the Eiffel, in the close neighborhood of where I grew up. Although there are billions of stars in our Milky Way, with our eyes, we can only see about 2,000. In comparison, the human genome has about 20,000 genes. But even with sophisticated molecular genetic techniques, we can only look at a couple of hundred of them. So we did this and we selected a gene panel comprising 770 genes, which is typically alterated in cancer. These genes are localized in the nucleus of a cell and are, um, wait, and are encoded as DNA. When the gene product of the gene is needed, it comes to processment of transportable copies. This process is called transcription and yields into messenger RNA, also called mRNA. And due to the corona pandemic, you all know mRNA. So these mRNA transcripts then leave the cell nucleus and go in the cytoplasm where the last step of protein biosynthesis takes place, which is translation and yields into protein. So looking at the mRNA transcripts can actually indicate the functional state of the genes. We did this and obtained a pretty big Excel file. There were lots of columns. Each column stands for a patient sample of a Spitz tumor that we were looking at, and lots of rows showing mRNA transcripts of the gene that we were interested in. As it is quite complex to look at such an Excel sheet, you can also display the data in form of a heat map. And again, it only concerns many columns and rows which are lined up. Each column shows a patient sample. And each row shows the mRNA transcript that we were interested in. Yellow and red color mean upregulation with a lot of available mRNA copies to look at, and blue color means downregulation with only a few copies. Alternatively, when you want to compare groups, you can also display the data in form of a volcano plot. Each blue dot stands for a gene transcript that you are looking at. And values above zero mean upregulation of the gene in group A versus group B. And values beneath zero mean downregulation. And the I axis shows the level of significance. And the black genes, they failed our applied level of significance. We did this comparison and found many 
differentially expressed genes in Spitznavels versus malignant Spitz tumor and in Spitznavels versus atypical Spitz tumor. This indicates that Spitznavels is definitely differently set up from a genetic point of view in comparison to atypical and malignant lesions. However, the last comparison was more challenging. There were only 18 differentially regulated genes in atypical Spitz tumor versus malignant Spitz tumor. It might be that the actual molecular genetic difference is not that big. With sophisticated molecular genetic analysis, we did identify a gene signature comprising six top ranked genes, which could reliably distinguish Spitz neighbors from malignant Spitz tumors with intermediate level for the atypical Spitz tumors. Our interim conclusions are. There is differential gene expression in all group of Spitz tumors, and there is a gene signature which can distinguish Spitz navels from malignant Spitz tumor. However, even with these sophisticated molecular genetic techniques, it remains extremely challenging to make the distinction between atypical Spitz tumor and malignant Spitz tumor. It might be that we have not found the right star yet, but it might also be that there are other factors beyond the tumor genome, which ultimately decide whether there's lymph node metastasis or spread to distant organs with death of the patient. Now, more about my um, studies about the tumor microenvironment of these cells. So again, I want you to think about if it's not the tumor genome which decides whether there's lymph node metastasis or distant metastasis. Uh, there must be something else, something like the immune system of the patient, the individual anti-cancer properties we don't know yet, or the tumor microenvironment around these lesions. So when you look at such a Spitz tumor cell, the cell is surrounded by many inflammatory cells, by stromal cells, and by peculiar blood vessels. We focused on the inflammatory cells and we identified different inflammatory patterns in these lesions, which we named IP0, IP2, IP3, IP3 with increasing inflammatory activity. This is what it looks like under the microscope and when you do immunohistochemistry staining for them. When we applied these inflammatory patterns to our Spitz tumors, we could see that the most predominant pattern in Spitz navels was the inflammatory pattern two with these yeah, striking lymphonodular aggregates at the base of the lesion. Interestingly, the inflammatory pattern three with severe inflammation was more often found in atypical lesions and malignant lesions. Our interim conclusions are, these lesions are highly immunogenic and inflammatory. The predominant pattern in Spitz navels is the inflammatory pattern too, but it's not distinctive for these lesions. And if you see severe inflammation as diagnosing pathologist, you should definitely rule out an underlying malignancy before you sign out your case. Finally, more about my ongoing studies and our future research plans. Of course, there is much more to find in the tumor microenvironment of these cells. So at the moment, we are focusing on their peculiar blood vessels, and we are putting special focus on capillaries which have plump endothelium. In the future, we want to do multiplex immunohistochemistry straining to get a better spatial impression about their tumor microenvironment, and to better identify the inflammatory subtypes in these lesions. We also want to go multi-center to get more samples and to create more robustness from our data. And finally, we really would like to look at the archival lymph node metastasis and distant metastasis of these tumor, because there might be more information about their underlying, underlying malignancy and their metastatic behavior. Thank you for your attention. And now I will give back the words to the prorector. Thank you for this very clear and enthusiastic presentation. 
The opposition will be opened by Professor Speel. Professor Speel is Professor of Molecular Oncopathology at the Maastricht University Medical Center, and he was the chairman of the assessment committee. Professor Speel. Thank you very much, uh, Prorector. Dear uh, PhD candidate, <laughs> um, first of all, congratulations with your thesis and inspiring presentation. Uh, interesting and relevant data you presented in your thesis. I congratulate you and of course also your husband, children, family and friends, and, not a, and also of course the supervisory team. Um, I would like to start my um, uh, questions, maybe to ask one of your uh, colleagues uh, uh, to uh, read proposition 11, who can start. Only the knowledge and skills you have acquired open your eyes to a new world because you only see what you know. Thank you. Uh, my question would be, uh, candidate, why have you called our Dutch world fame football player, Johan Cruijff, an unknown author? Uh, sorry, again? <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, sorry, let me start correctly. Dear what? highly esteemed opponent, <laughs> thank you for your kind words and thank you for your <laughs> question. Um, I'm not so good at Can you football, repeat? so... Um, now, Johan Cruijff uh, said often uh, in Dutch, je gaat het pas zien als je het door hebt, which is probably what you mean there. So I, I didn't know why you didn't, why uh -huh. you refer to an unknown author instead of Johan Cruijff. But maybe okay. that was not into your mind. <laughs> okay. It's not the German yeah. Dutch. Um, no, okay. Good. Uh, I should watch more soccer. <laughs> may, maybe I, I quickly go to the second uh, pr uh, proposition, which is 10. Maybe the other colleague can read proposition 10. The revolution of molecular diagnostic technique is changing the face of pathology and will supersede the histological diagnostic of many diseases. Accurate molecular diagnostic pathology, however, ultimately depends on strong histological criteria for diagnosis. Thank you. And candidate, my question would be, I do not agree with the second part, or am I wrong? Or I can say it may be simple, like uh, a couple of colleague uh, molecular or medical oncologists say, you just take some frozen tissue by biopsy or excision, you do a cyst tumor purity with shallow sequencing, then you do whole genome sequencing and you're ready. So I do not agree with the second part. Yeah, dear highly esteemed opponent, um, I, I also often face this problem that um, actually the histopathology is somewhat overruled and people say, yeah, just stick the tissue in the machine and it will tell you what for genomic changes there are and then we know what to treat. But yeah, if you don't look at the tissue, it might be that you put just normal tissue inside. So you definitely have to look at the tissue first and then get it in a clinical context to actually know what you have to look for, because it's also not that easy to look at all genes at one moment. You have to focus, you have to apply distinct panels in dependency on what you're looking at. So. Yeah, you, what, what, what panels do you have maybe in mind then? Um, yeah, it depends on the um, region. So you, you first can can uh, do um, um, yeah um, um, a technique where you, you actually are looking for just one translocation. Then you do fish analysis through sense and in situ hybridization where you actually see how how genes are translocated. Um, but you can also do an um, MGS next gene sequencing. Um, where you can look at, yeah, let's say if in our panel, we have 47 genes, I think, at the moment, where we look at selected cancer mm -hmm. genes. Um, but you can also do, and what we will do more now is doing um, yeah, a, a more broader approach, where we can actually see already not only the mutation, but also translocations, which is the true site oncology panel, where you can look at, yeah, 500 genes. What so, would you prefer to do? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, actually, from an explorative point of view, I would prefer to do as much as possible, but then there's this cost um, argument, so it's, um, I, I would really like to do the, the broad panel to also discover um, new alterations, because 
you only see what you're looking for. So if you only focus on our set of genes that we always do, we will not explore new ones. So um, I would like to do the, the um, broad analysis, but yeah, this is not, um, yeah, you cannot um, do that in case of costs. But you think whole genome sequencing like medical oncologists would like to just pick it and we know everything is, is maybe not true or can you not see what a Spitz tumor is from a whole genome sequence? Um, yeah, you can actually quite easily identify with, with the new knowledge, which has evolved in the last couple of years. You can actually nicely indicate that it's a Spitz tumor because these lesions have specific translocations, which you can only find in Spitz tumors, but usually not in conventional melanocytic lesions. But still then you, you need to know the number of, of the, the yeah, you need to know the number of genetic changes because this indicates that there's malignancy. So the pathway can easily be identified, mm -hmm. but the um, the dignity of the lesion, you have to really make guessing work. It's it's approach, it's coming more exactly, it's becoming more exactly, but we are still mm. struggling in between these atypical spitz tumors and malignant spitz tumors. But it might help. It might it, help. It might help, but yeah. not as a first choice in your opinion. Yeah, actually it's it's quite sad because quite often these lesions are diagnosed retrospectively. So when metastasis has occurred, you upgrade the lesion as malignant spitz tumor. Because especially in children, you are very reluctant to, to call it malignant Spitz tumor. So you but maybe you find also some new targets that, that yeah. are therapeutic targets. That's uh, interesting, directly. also something what they are now there are also case series out there where they are um doing um yeah, um they were if you have an ALK translocation, let's say those they are applying crisotinib to the patient uh, to actually um to, to narrow down or the the spreading. So. so so you still agree with me or <laughs> you agree with your proposition? Um yeah I think there are we we both have a good point. Yeah. <laughs> we both have a good point. Okay, that's a nice uh, <laughs> end for the next uh, okay. thank you very much and I give uh, give the word back to the product. Thank you, Professor Spiel. The opposition will be continued online um, by Dr. Blox. Dr. Blox is a pathologist at the University Hospital of Utrecht and was a member of the assessment committee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Blox, for participating in this Maastricht University thesis defense. And um, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Dear PhD candidate, uh, I would also like to uh, start with congratulating you with your uh, thesis and also your uh, promoter and co-promoter uh, with this uh, results. Uh, as you probably know, I'm uh, very uh, enthusiastic about uh, spitz tumors and their molecular pathology. Um, I had a bit of a problem with your title because you use spitzoids. Could you explain why you do that? Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your questions. So, um, the the spitz so eat spitz spitz like um, definitions are really mixed up, messed up. But if you use spitz so eat, you you um, go with the morphology. So you do not really exactly know the underlying genetic changes and it might be that it's also a conventional melanoma which um, just shows spitzoid appearance which is this epithelioid and spindle shape morphology so if you want to say spitz you actually have to identify characteristic genetic alterations so and this is actually also a yeah, it was a game changer in 2019 when there was um, a publication where they analyzed spitz to eat melanomas, spitz tumors, where they actually looked, is this a conventional melanoma which looks spitz to eat or is this a real spitz tumor? And they only had 30 of their spitz to eat tumors, which actually were real malignant spitz tumor. So you have to be yes, very I fully, careful. Yes, I fully agree with that. Uh, um... But your thesis is mainly on 
at least I think you've thought that you were analyzing Spitz tumors. So I was a bit uh, teased by the title that it said Spitzoid. Um, so the, um, the, this whole paradigm came up, um, I think in 2019, it became more and more clear. The WHO, which actually defines this new pathway of melanoma, came out in 2017, 2018, and we designed this study before. So in those days, actually, the morphology was clearly overruling um, the, um, the ultimate diagnosis. Now we are taking this more careful. The, the WHO still says morphology is the first to do with the gold standard. But then they also say it has to be in adjunction with these molecular genetic um, alterations. And this we cannot um, clearly um, yeah, assure for each case we used. Yeah. So, so the, I, I actually the, looked the, up afterwards. The, hmm? So the value of your results of your uh, RNA expression profiling might be uh, a bit blurred by the fact that you included tumors as, for instance, malignant spitz tumor but you were not sure uh, whether there was, for instance, a BRAF or an NRAS mutation, because uh, in your chapter four, I think it is, you have some malignant spitz tumors that uh, finally show um, metastasis, but you did not perform any of the tests. At least I could not see it in um, immunohistochemistry or molecular testing to really confirm the spitzoid or spitz nature of the lesion. Is that true? I totally agree. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree with that. There might be a blur. There's um, actually Spitz tumors and malignant Spitz tumors behave much better than malignant melanoma. So if you have a Spitz tumor, you can actually think ah, it's not malignant melanoma. So and this, yeah. um, hmm? if you would redesign your study, um, if you would uh, do this all over again, you would probably uh, now have the tools to do that and to include really properly spitz lesions within your study and do, then do the RNA expression profiling. I would be very interesting, interested to see what you get then. Yeah, we actually think about, um, yeah, we, we will. Um, so it's, it's a bit difficult to get back to the data because in chapter four, some were taken from another university hospital, but those from us, I looked up. And um, so, but I think with the knowledge which is now available, we would definitely design the study differently. We would do a pre-selection. We would do screening with um, NTRAC, um, ALK, and ROS uh, to, to identify the most common translocations. And in these cases where we, we, we do not found anything, we would also do um, a broad sequencing. To, to clarify that we are really looking at Spitz tumors. Yeah, this knowledge was not there in yeah. 2016, but it's, um, yeah, it's really kind of uh, coming up with um, specific um, alterations, yeah, indicates a Spitz, um, yeah, a Spitz pathway, which is, yeah, defined by the WHO. If you look at, at all the molecular testing that we have available now for Spitz tumors, um, is there a role for your mRNA expression profiling to improve uh, what we have now? Um, I think it definitely can show differences in between these categories, but it's, um, it's a not standard diagnostic approach. So this research was done in an explorative manner, and I'm not sure if it will come to diagnostics um, and the nano string. So I think some centers actually perform, but these are really expert tertiary centers which do that. We don't do that in a diagnostic standard yet. No, so. perhaps in the future when, when you have a, a, a really a clear, a defined set of uh, uh, proven spitz lesions that could be uh, possible. I have a question about um, uh, the plasma cells you found also in your uh, chapter on the immune infiltrate in the spitz lesions. Um, I think that most of us as pathologists experience that we see often lymphocytes in spitz tumors and that the plasma cells are mainly present in melanoma. I don't know whether that's also your experience. And if you 
have an explanation for that? Um, so um, the presence of plasma cells is actually also quite sel seldom in melanoma. So you, you really have to screen lots of melanomas to, to see um, increase of plasma cells. And the plasma cells we saw were also very few. And um, plasma cell indicates, yeah, B cell lineage production of um, a B cell enter antibodies. And this actually um, has shown to be of good prognosis. So um, we don't really see these in Spitz tumors. One idea I have is that the T cells are majorly exhausted in these lesions. So um, maybe they are not really attracted. So yeah, I think why we didn't see plasma cells. Yeah, it, I at, think this is a very specific of, marker. Mm -hmm. When you think of the clinical um, um, picture of a Spitz tumor, it often grows very rapid. Do you think that it has something to do with that and that melanoma can really grow much slower so you develop a, another immune response? Yeah, that's, that's something what I, I what's really striking. So these Spitz tumors, they evolve in months. There's a typical evolution of these Spitz tumors. And when the dermatoscopy is not that um, suspicious, these tumors are left. And after 27 months, they are just gone. So they grow quite hard, but then fail-safe mechanisms of the cell come and yeah, restrict these spit cells in growing. And the reason why they are growing much faster than conventional melanocytic lesions might be because um, the, it's quite often that they have HRAS um, uh, of mutations, and these are actually more going in the um, PA3 um, kinase pathway and not so much in the mitogene activated pathway, which might be an answer for the higher uh, volume of cytoplasm and their more, yeah, more severe growth. So, and actually this might also be an answer why they are so immunogenic because a point mutation does not show so much neoantigen. But if you look at these translocations, these are quite big chimeric proteins. So there might be a lot of neoantigen for the immune system to detect so but yeah that's only speculative so um. okay thank you for your answers i do not have any further questions thank you dr blocks uh, the opposition will be continued by professor ramakers professor ramakers is emeritus professor of molecular cell biology at maastricht university and is also a member of this assessment committee yeah thank you uh, mr corrector uh, dear candidate, Lisa, uh, first of all, congratulations with this beautiful uh, thesis, uh, also to your supervisors and family, of course. Um, I must say I was impressed when this uh, thesis came into my mailbox. Uh, I was not only impressed by the weight, I mean, it's uh, and, and the content, but also by the layout. It's, it's beautiful. And also your presentation was uh, fantastic um, in that sense. And also... Uh, content wise. Um, but when looking at your cover, um, actually, uh, the first impression that came up to me was that you tried to tell us that viruses uh, might play a role in the development and maybe progression of the uh, of the spitz, uh, spitz lesions. So the and, and since I know that, let's say your your group, your your promoter has worked, uh, and his father has have worked a lot on viruses playing and still working on viruses playing a role in the development of cancer. I was wondering, is there anything known? Uh, have studies been done? Uh, is there a chance that viruses play a role in this type of uh, skin cancer? Because you know Merkel cells and and, and ports are actually uh, caused by viruses. Yeah, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and your kind words. Uh, thank you for your question. So this um, layout, it was frustrating because that were the first answers, which I got actually from my father. He was saying, oh, this is Corona. Yeah. I was like, these are T cells. So that's the ultra structure of T cells and these, these things which stick out there, these spikes. 
are actually the yeah CD3, the, the T cell receptor. Yeah, so I, I, I read that when I finished the thesis, and, <laughs> and on the last page I saw that these were the, but. Please. This is, is you only chance? know what you see. Huh? Is there so. a, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah, I translated my, that. Sie werden es nicht sehen, bis Sie es verstehen. Yeah. Uh, Karl, huh? uh, but viruses and the role in Spitz. Is there, is there yeah, any Yeah, so in the introduction, I um, actually evolve on the pathogenesis of these Spitz tumors and um, I report hormonal um, influences are found in the evolvement of Spitz tumors, pregnant persons, also one person with Morbus Edison, um, and um, immunosuppression. And there's a recent case report also about a kid which, which had immunosuppression due to um, treatment against um, ALL and uh, evolved lots of Spitz tumors and clonal ones. And mm -hmm. this, this clonality is also somewhat reminiscent to a rash of a viral infection. And there's one case with, um, with where HIV um, mm. is um, reported in association with Spitznavus, but to date there is no viral etiology um, proven, of, we have definitely proven yet, but I, but I still think you, you cannot rule that out because they have this, yeah, some opaque cytoplasm and the, the the answer it's immune suppression, yeah. But when there's immune suppression, you quite often have infections. So this might go together, and it's definitely yeah. associated. So yeah. you have, cannot have you do. Checked, have you checked HPV or polyoma? I mean, um, easy to do in your lab. <laughs> yeah. So um, we checked um, the DNA for them for yeah. polyoma uh, viruses, and we could not prove it um, on. Um, next level. So I mm. think we saw some results, but it's, yeah, you, you PCR results is always please check results. So um, we, we, we were not able to prove it further. So, so are you yeah. saying it's still an open But it's just polyoma virus we looked at. I think in the broad primer, which yeah. shows m more, more, yeah, more sensitive polyoma viruses, but yeah. still an open question. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. Um, I have a second question. Um, I, I I looked up in the literature uh, whether there's uh, reviews on the uh, uh, on 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 the, let's say uh, genomic changes in Spitz tumors, and I came across the paper by Wiesner, yeah. which you refer to, uh, the the review paper, and Wiesner actually uh, makes a point for the RB protein, the, the retinoblastoma protein. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, I tried to find it in your thesis by scanning through it, but I did not find any reference or reference or let's say any data on the uh, possible role of a retinoblastoma protein in Spitz development. Mm -hmm. Or why is that? I mean, uh, mm, I think it's it's. Oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. no, no, go ahead. Yeah. So. Um, that's that's a good question. So RB is really down um, in the cell cycle, and I think the changes in Spitz tumors are really yeah quite often in the receptor or in the MAP um, PK pathway. So um, I think this would be a secondary hit. So the first hit they have, which makes proliferation, is the in the receptor tyrosine kinase, and then there is later a second hit, but it's most often TERD or P10 mutations, but it might also be RB. And I think in the general discussion, okay. I, I had- I, um, believe, I believe you. Uh, I mean, it's not a, it's not a first hit, then, I understand. <laughs> I have to finish, I, yeah. uh, I understand. Uh, so thank you for your answers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramakers. Your position will be continued by Professor Stalen. Professor Stalen is professor of dermatology at the Maastricht University Medical Center and also a member of this assessment committee. Professor Stalen. Yeah. Dear PhD candidate, first of all, I would also like to congratulate you with your thesis and also I would like to congratulate your promoter and co-promoter. The results described in your thesis are very relevant for clinical practice and above all for the patients with the speech uh, uh, nevi. Um, but I was also uh, liked very much your cover, and uh, uh, I, I, but I had, I had another question than my uh, former uh, opponent. Uh, what about the DNA picture? Is the DNA molecule turning to the left or is it turning to the right? Or is it just an artist impression? Um, mm, so it's so yeah, actually, um, 
this one is turning to the right, so to the left. Hmm. It's an artistic impression because in the in here you can see it uh, upside down. So here, so it's yes, but it's actually yeah. the the whole DNA um, um, stands for the mRNA actually. But this is not. Yeah, but so nice also when you look at this slide, there, is it turning to the left or to the right? Yeah. It's going to the. I have the right. impression it's turning to the left, and um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but somewhere in your your in your presentation you had the, the um, and helix which was turning to the right, and yeah. I understood that uh, that in in the uh, for humans the DNA helix is going to the right, and uh, so but in your presentation uh, you had it correct. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but maybe also you want to just to reflect the rarity of speech uh, tumors, mm. because uh, I think uh, uh, helix. Uh, turning to the right are uh, do exist but are very rare mm -hmm. so i was maybe i was thinking that maybe the artist was reflecting with this picture the rarity of uh, of spitz uh, tumors so um but uh, thank you uh, um, for your explanation um uh, but uh, your, your, the, the coverage is important, but of course the content is, is much more important. And uh, in the discussion on page 193, you describe that the pathologist is the principal actor in the revolution of healthcare because pathologists are the only capable to integrate histomorphology, the features and the molecular characteristics of disease together with the clinical data of the patient. My question is, what role do you see for the dermatologist? Again? Okay. What, what role do you see for the dermatologist? Oh, yeah, I really need you because without your clinical data and your analysis and actually your selection on what to excise or biopsy, uh, I don't have any work. So um, I, and I think the, especially with Spitz tumors, that, that's something really strange. And maybe I did not emphasize that enough. So. You see a Spitz tumor, and the first thing you ask is, what's the age of the patient? And yeah. this is, for what I know, you uh, need you. So you need to tell me, is this lesion evolving rapidly? Is it in a seven-year-old child where you think, mm, okay, or is it in a 70-year-old person where you say, oh, my God. So that's uh, in the diameter, for example, of the lesion is the other distinct characteristic where we really are doing our diagnosis on. So I think... Spitz tumors, you definitely have to uh, diagnose in conjunction with the clinical data. They are as important as the histopathological and oh. the molecular genetic alterations. So, okay, um. thank you. I'm very happy with uh, your, <laughs> your answer. <laughs> and uh, do you think, uh, have, with, with now artificial intelligence maybe taking over the dermatologist, art uh, intelligence maybe taking over the pathologist, what is the future perspective of pathology when you look in? The, uh, is the computer taking over? Yeah, um, so I think it will be a nice adjunct too. And um, if you're not if you're not having too much artifacts in the tissue, it's working quite well, especially for lesions which have like a pathognomic um, appearance. We're we're doing a research on BCC basal cell carcinoma where where we are doing actually quite well. We are performing with an ex exactly of ninety seven percent or something, um, but with for example, for Spitz tumors, it's more challenging because you would first need a big data set, 3,000, 4,000 samples yeah. to, to really teach the algorithm. And um, then, um, yeah, I think the histopathology is sometimes not so clear, so distinguishing. So I think the things which we can see in a minute, an AI can also see and differentiate quite well. Yeah. The things where you have to struggle, where you have to look but more do you into... have to worry in the next 20 years that we still need pathologists? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, yes. so then, uh, yes. and I'm happy also with this answer, <laughs> for, uh, especially for the pathologists, I'm happy. And the uh, last short question is about, uh, the, in your thesis, you described the uh, it is difficult to differentiate AST from MST on histological features uh, due to the poor reproducibility mm -hmm. related to the inter-observer var variation between pathologists and the lack of a golden standard. Now you use in chapter four, you use these uh, 51 specimens in, from which you says, describes that 10 are atypical and 14 are malignant. How confident are you that, that these diagnoses are correct? Yeah, so in chapter four, these data are from 2016. So um, 10 of these cases are from another center. So, and we actually asked the other center to, uh, if they have malignant Spitz tumor, because we have these 
diagnosed so rarely, and we were quite surprised that they had so many. So it might be that it's also center dependent how often you mix this diagnosis. And um, with uh, the data in chapter four, I'm more confident because there we always send it out for a tertiary um, expert opinion. So we we were looking at the case and also send it out as well to okay. um, Utrecht yeah. and. Uh, okay, I'm and happy to... with your answer. Uh, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, I would like to give the word back to the prorector. Thank you, Professor Stalen. Your position will be continued online by Professor Tetzlaff. Professor Tetzlaff is a professor of pathology at the University of California, San Francisco, and he was a member of the assessment committee. Professor Tetzlaff, thank you for staying up um, this late, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Good. Okay, good. Well, first, um, I, didn't, I didn't stay up. I actually woke up. It's, it's in the middle of the night here in San Francisco. I, I'm really happy to be here. And I wanted to congratulate you uh, and your mentors on a beautiful thesis and a very, very insightful presentation um, this morning. It's, it was a really, very nice, nicely done uh, work and effort. Um, my, my questions um, relate a little bit to uh, some things that have been already asked, but uh, perhaps in a different way. Um, I want you to tell me a little bit about your view of the difference as we practice today of spits versus spitzoid. Um, you, you use the spitzoid terminology quite a lot, and I understand that it was from a, a, a time when we didn't make the distinction really from a molecular standpoint, but tell me from a, from a practical perspective, your view of the difference between when we call something spits and what that means versus when we call something spitzoid and what that means. And then I have some follow-up from that. Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. So there are these really yeah, landmark articles from, from your group, actually, so uh, which, which makes a difference in between spitz and spitz to eat melanoma, for example, where you um, in, in spitz to eat melanoma, you have um, changes which actually um, yeah, um, are, can be subscribed to be rough alteration, conventional melanoma do that, and they just have the morphology of a Spitz tumor, but they are actually malignant melanoma. They also show high frame expression, and um, they, they can also show um, other typical mutations which you see in conventional melanoma. And the Spitz melanoma, the malignant Spitz tumor, uh, really should be used when you have um, assured it from a genetic um, point of view and when you have assured these specific alterations which are characteristic for Spitz tumor. So um, MHARAS, ALK, ROS, NTRAC, translocations, and um, ROS, MET. So these ones typically go with Spitz tumor. So there, there must be made a difference. And this is also yeah important for the prognosis because the Spitz lesions most often have a better prognosis than conventional melanoma. At least in children, we know. Excellent. So then tell me, when you see a Spitz lesion under the microscope, what is your workup or your, your approach to the diagnosis from not only morphology, but also markers that we can use readily in practice from immunohistochemistry and how we could see integrating your results into that diagnostic approach, even though I understand you've already said it's very exploratory, how can we try to move your results into how we approach diagnosing uh, Spitz lesions? Yeah, um, so if you, if you see a um, classical circumscribed symmetric Spitz lesion, even though the cells are looking atypical. This is in the nature of these Spitz cells. And if it's a young child and the clinical history fits, you, you can just rule out the, or sign out the case as the Spitz navels and you don't have to do any further study. As soon as you see atypical features such as increase in size, um, deep dermal mitosis, ulceration, asymmetry, and so on, you should screen for that case because you really want to narrow down this diagnosis atypical Spitz tumor. You either want to say Spitznavus with 
this and this and this translocation, or you want to go to yeah, Meltamp or malignant spitz tumor. So then you screen, and you can easily screen with immunohistochemistry for the most common translocations, and you use NTRAC, ROS, ARC, and um, you, you look for a um, high RAS mutation, and um, then you can also do um, a P16, which might indicate more malignancy. And if you have not found anything there, then you should go broader with an NGS to, to assure the Spitz lineage, but only in case that you really are worried that it's atypical or malignant. So, yeah, I think most lesions can be done on histo histology still. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And, and then your data, do, do you envision some of these genes that you've identified uh, being amenable to immunohistochemistry or other types of assays to integrate these findings into what you just talked about with your approach, say a worrisome lesion where you think this is an atypical Spitz tumor versus this is a Spitz melanoma. Do you see that there's a role for your results to perhaps make an immunohistochemistry assay or some other molecular assay to bring into that diagnostic approach? Um, yeah, this is actually our aim, but we are, um, I, I think I've read it five or six times that we are aiming to do, to identify the signature on protein level, and we have the antibodies in our lab and we are trying them, but they are polyclonal and they are rabbit and they give a diffuse background. So I have the impression that the mRNA signature we identified is not really very easy to show on protein level because the, these alterations are too fine and can't be seen with yeah, a shade of brown in immunohistochemistry chemistry versus another shade of brown. So these genes are very difficult to, to show with antibodies, although we are yeah, really trying. So I think it, if it would go to diagnostics, you still would need to approach such a sophisticated mRNA technique, which might become cheaper in the future and more customized. So yeah. Thank you. I'm very uh, satisfied with your answers, and I, I really appreciate uh, being able to participate. And I, I return the floor to uh, further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's love. The opposition will be continued uh, by Dr. Weyers. Dr. Weyers is a private, private docent um, for dermatopathology at the Center for Dermatopathology in Freiburg. Dr. Weyers. Yes, first of all, congratulations, of course. Yeah. Um, well, the discussion that we had made me think a little bit. Yeah, So I start with a consideration. I think in 1748, Louis Leclerc de Buffon, French zoologist and botanist, said when defining an entity, defining species in zoology and botany in nature, you need to take into account all features all aspects, which is in your uh, in your uh, statement number 10, not only molecular uh, uh, molecular aspects, but also histology and, of course, clinical uh, pictures. And this is where Sophie Spitz failed. She didn't take into account the clinical pictures, which were harmless and evi, and only focused on cytology. Now, the hope, of course, is that the different aspects integrate and correlate with one another, clinical, with system pathology, with molecular, in order to define an entity. This is how it's done in general biology. Now, the hope was when studying Spitz neoplasms or Spitzoid neoplasms, whatever, that molecular findings correlate with system pathologic findings and clinical findings. Now, as we heard in this discussion, this is not the case. Many so-called Spitzer melanomas, they are different. In your thesis, you don't address difficult issues such as a Spitzer Clark's nevus, yeah? uh, pattern, architecture of a Clark's nevus, cytology of a Spitz nevus. Now, taking all this into account, how can you claim that Spitzer melanocytic neoplasms are a distinct group, an entity, if those features do not correlate with one another? 
Yeah, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind word and your yeah, interesting considerations and your questions. So um, I, I more and more think that um, <laughs> the Spitz uh, tumors are sort of a, yeah, a garbage bag um, because we are we 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 actually the Spitz actually only um, describes the morphology, but the underlying genetic alterations are so variable that it it might become in the future like at the moment we have nine pathways in melanoma it might become 20 or 30 and then it's the ALK translocated and the ROS translocated and so at the moment we are limping it together as Spitz but actually this entity is um, yeah is um, is quite variable from the um, genetic alterations so yeah um, but but still the um, the the what also really interesting is that the the the, the RAS uh, the protein actually de decide how the morphology is developing. So HRAS has this um, desmoplastic, and BRAF has this conventional navels morphology. So there's still that you can actually see that the morphology correlates with the underlying alterations. So, so there is some correlation, but it's poor, and this implies that it's not a distinct group, basically. Yeah. Um, Spitz has been also in your thesis, also in the WHA O classification, uh, uh, separate into those three uh, groups, benign, intermediate, malignant. Um, what is the definition then of malignant? And is there such a thing as a benign neoplasm? Yeah, so malignant. Uh actually yeah used to be defined by the hallmarks of cancer like um going around senescence um restricting uh, growth and um also yeah metastasis but this actually does really not account for spitz tumors because they metastasize in 50 percent of cases or might be even more but we don't sample that so we don't know but uh the the definition of malignancy is actually uh, invasive growth metastasis and death of the patient but yeah, so I think the, the whole metast metastatic issue is quite does not really account for Spitz lesions because they metastasize to the lymph region and lymph nodes without any consequence. So yeah, yeah but uh, you know, if it's a capability to kill mm -hmm. a malignant lesion, you know, if it's obviously they don't have to kill. Yeah, early stages do not, but they have the capability to kill if not interfered with, and if the patient lives long enough, of course. Yeah, if this is the definition of malignant, now any neoplasm that fulfills this definition should be dubbed malignant. Is there such a thing as a benign neoplasm? Yeah. Um, yeah so they these benign, so the class one uh, melanocytic lesions actually just show one alteration where it's becoming more gross, like more an activating mutation. And then you you have this pathway, which is grading up the lesions to malignancy with more and more genetic alterations. Because yeah, so there there are these these lesions which are almost malignant, where you have like three copy number vari variations, and then you have four, and then you say okay, now it is melanoma. So this is also a great so this clear cut malignant um, is quite difficult. And I think the whole focus on the tumor genome is really nice and we're getting this better and more detailed now but there's still the metastatic cascade which is so much more difficult and there are so much more factors which ultimately decide whether this malignant lesion metastasizes in the one individual and in the other doesn't so you would also have to ask okay is this is a malignant case but this is a young child which has a very plastic immune system and can cope with it so yeah it's it's hard to really say this neoplasm is not malignant or malignant. You most often know retrospectively, for sure. Yeah. There is currently a strong focus on uh, the genotype of neoplasms rather than the phenotype of neoplasms. Yeah. Um, now, your work, in a way, uh, goes a little bit away from, from the genotype by taking into account also uh, 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 basically uh, metabolic aspects, immune system and so forth. And what is the influence 
and to which degree has it been studied of simply reversible metabolic influences on the morphology and the behavior of spitzer neoplasms or and, other yeah. uh, melanocytic so neoplasms. In, in spitz tumors it's totally understudied and at the moment we are really focusing on all these nice genetic alterations but i think um, the focus will shift so in the future we will have to um, you can shortly answer the question yeah in the future we, we have to focus on the things around the tumor microenvironment the immune system and this is much more difficult to tackle so this will be the challenge for the upcoming years i think yeah. thank you lisa maria helen rose the degree um, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room.
Lisa Maria Helen Roos. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Zurhausen is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Lisa Maria Helen Rolf, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Continue with the laudation I was waiting for a sign, but actually, um, dear Lisa, dear Dr. Lisa, wow. So <laughs> congratulations again. And actually, they um, they said in the weather forecast today that there will be lots of thunderstorms and lightnings, and today, this afternoon, but actually, we already experienced the first thunderstorm this day uh, in here with lots of intellectual lightnings from all the uh, all the discussion which we had. And actually, I'd like to thank especially our guests and opponents for making this such a special situation and challenging moment for you. You really did a brilliant job, really good. I'm really proud of you, but I show you later how proud I am. And uh, not that I'm surprised at this, of course. I know that you basically fear this moment more than your defense because um, I will tell you in a second. It's a historic and memorable moment uh, today, May 20, 22, 10, 14. I will come back to this later. It's special for you, for your family, your co-promoter, of course, who is actually the, the true promoter because intellectually the input came from her. <laughs> and uh, she's actually also your supervisor because you were working on her projects. But let's start right back from the beginning because you started here Ah, I think some 10 years ago, uh, not close, but very close as a resident. So you started the training in pathology here in Maastricht, which of course is, apologies to Utrecht, it's of course the best place to get your training in pathology in the Netherlands. <laughs> and um, so you very fast uh, showed that you were really dedicated to learning. And it was actually impressive to see the ease how you acquired all these diagnostic skills. And so it was clear that something special was happening to you and also to our department. You also showed that you're really dedicated to uh, teaching. You take hours to teach students. You even forget your schedule while teaching. <laughs> and, um, and you're also very much, yeah, you further develop this. You put this on a higher level because you develop apps together with Wilco and with others to, um, to help understanding and to help to promote actually pathology. You give fantastic lectures. You're regularly selected as the best presentation on our science days. And um, that is really impressive. There's far more than we expected from our, uh, from our um, residents. So you also showed an early interest in science and research questions. And that was mainly due to a pathologist who was uh, very much dedicated to dermatopathology and talking about strange nevi and actually also holds an own research line in this. So uh, basically you came together and you developed, so you developed this project. And very soon it was evident after the first publication that this will be a, uh, a PhD thesis because uh, as uh, just to refer to, 
the uh, maybe not, not too many people know him, but Jan Valbomer Val said, if the first paper is published, former molecular pathologist of diagnostics at the Free University in Amsterdam, if the first paper is published, you will make the rest, of course. So um, you managed to do this, and you did this really, really well. And uh, you started on this project, and um, you developed it, and you um, published these papers. And actually, we hope that we can even take you, uh, advantage of your enthusiasm for this project also to, to finish this whole research line of uh, Veronique. And uh, so it's very, uh, we're very much looking forward to this. Finally, you became a, um, a staff member and um, you managed actually to, to cope with all these challenges of family and also to overcome major health issues. I'm really impressed. You're really a role model uh, for, uh, for so many of us how to cope with difficult situations. And I'd like to show you all my respect also to your family, how you cope with these situations. So um, very impressive with this. Actually, and I was just discussing, or we just heard it, that you also did um, lots of other um, publications, not only dermatopathology. I actually saw that your papers in neuroendocrine neoplasms are the lung outnumbers the number of this thesis. So uh, we have to talk about this. So um, basically, before we do this, I'd uh, like to say that with your thesis, your defense today, which I think is the best layman's talk I've heard since long, I'm really impressed, impressed with this. Your skills to translate complicated scientific issues to layman's or to the public is impressive. With your ambition and your hardworking attitude, you are, of course, a high potential in academic pathology. And uh, now we come to the second part, why I think that this is a very memorable day, because I think it's actually the first time since I know Lisa, and maybe also the last time, that Lisa just has to listen. She can't <laughs> talk in between. So I take advantage of this, and uh, I won't stop, don't worry. <laughs> and um, because it's, uh, it's very, I think it will not come back. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, of course, if you work that hard, there's also some, some shadow. There's, uh, this shadow, if you have some, too much light, there's lots of shadow as well. But in your case, it's only very small shadow. And this is about your focus. And come and talking about these many neuroendocrine papers you have, you facilitate research, you're so enthusiastic, you just go for it. And that is really, really impressive. But of course, uh, sometimes very difficult to follow and also sometimes difficult to finish the projects which you all started, all the um, contacts you made. So to, to cite my very first mentor in pathology, which is, was the great Andrew Hubosch from Sloan Kettering said, first read about it, then we talk about it. <laughs> and, uh, so this is, um, but this is only minor, minor revisions, I would say. And you're very independent, very independent researcher. Independent researchers need to communicate and actually, uh, you do this on a high level, but what you don't know yet is that we already built a task force. The task force is built up by Ancien, Veronique, and me in order to promote and help you to achieve all your academic goals as far as we can. And basically, let me finish uh, with this, this speech here. I'm very proud of you. And uh, the family, Vilko, the parents could be very proud of you as well. You did a brilliant job. And also on behalf of Veronique, who I think was very nervous today, <laughs> and uh, it's all of these very sophisticated questions. All of us, thank you very much for doing this PhD with us, your great contribution to our department. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. Helen Wolfs. Also, on behalf of the Board of Deans of Maastricht University, I congratulate, congratulate you with, your, with the honor that you have acquired. Now it's time to celebrate with your family, your friends, and your colleagues. I would like to thank the guests from abroad for participating in this thesis defense. And I would like to ask the audience to leave the room so that we can make some pictures. I would also like to ask the uh, opponents online to stay so that we can include you in the picture. And with this, I will close this academic ceremony. <laughs>